Uh, I'll call the Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order at 5.02. And I need to go over to my agenda to see what's first, sorry. Uh, first thing on the agenda, review and approve the minutes of October 14th. We have a motion. So moved. I'll second. Any discussion or amendments? No. Roll call vote. Jessica, yes. Peter? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? I read his lips. He said yes. Approved 5 0. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, can we have a financial statement, please? Uh, since last meeting, there were 10 warrants totaling $41,553.49 reviewed and signed electronically. Uh, I did send you the expense reports through November 30th. There are no concerns to report at this time as far as the general fund goes. Um, we do have some savings, so that's a positive news uh, from various accounts for a variety of reasons. Um, the primary thing to report on at this time is the school lunch. I did give you a snapshot and a report that I sent out today. Sorry, I didn't get that to you yesterday and I thank you for your patience. Um, <clears throat> we're currently looking at a year-to-date net income of a negative $6,646 in the school lunch program. Our current balance is uh, around 14,500 because of money that we had left remaining at the end of last year. Um, so on the trajectory that we're going along right now, uh, I do believe that we are not going to have enough revenue to support our expenditures. Um, and I'd like to make the recommendation tonight that we start with moving our food service director off of the school lunch revolving account, account salaries and wages onto the local budget. Um, there are savings to cover that expense for the year. It's just shy of $9,000, which is just Sunderland's portion of the food service director salary. Um, so I think that that would be a wise start for us. I'd like to continue to monitor the account and also monitor our wages because we have seen a decrease in wages with the cafeteria staff with the closure or not closure, but the fully remote option for school. Um, so we are seeing that our staff have had their hours reduced. So I do expect that wages will be less. Um, if you recall, last spring, we did cover all of our salaries and wages. But at this point, we're not in a position to continue doing that, given we're not um, making enough money month to month to cover all of those expenses. But with that said, I want to sit on that, the staffing piece um, for the kitchen staff a little bit longer. Normally it's around $40,000 for wages in Sunderland for the staff outside of the food service director. Um, I'd like to keep a little bit closer eye on it. We will have to rectify any negative balance by the end of the year. Um, and I'm hoping we can do that with general fund savings as I'm recommending we're able to do with the director position. But again, want to keep an eye on it. <clears throat> Um, any questions about that before I give a school choice update? I'm assuming you will just go ahead and do that uh, transfer for the food service director. You don't need our approval for that. So the other school committees have been voting. I'm not sure that you technically need to, but just to have stamp of approval and transparency and how we're handling the accounts. Um, one other town has also done this move already. So we did have that school committee vote. So if you're not opposed to it, I think it's a good idea just to have it on record that you're in support of it. So can I make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, uh, business director's uh, proposal to move the food salary director's salary from the school lunch program to the general budget? I'll second. Any discussion? Should we can vote it now. Okay. Uh, Jessica, yes. Peter? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Thumbs up. Passes 5 0. Great. Thank you. I appreciate your support and backing behind that decision. Um, so, the last piece was we had talked about this last month. Uh, Peter had asked some questions about the school choice fund and enrollment in particular. 
Um, so Ben and uh, our special education director, Karen Ferrandino and I did go ahead and look at those numbers. Um, enrollment is slightly lower in our October one enrollment than it was on the June 30th. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that there you know, won't be additional fluctuation throughout the year, um, which could be in our benefit if we have any students enroll mid-year. But right now, um, we're looking at, I think, around four students shy of what we were at the end of last fiscal year. And uh, one of those students does have some special education increment claiming funds that we were able to put in for last year. Um, so our, right now, the anticipated reduction is around $35,000 $35, less than what we have budgeted in school choice. Um, so obviously, that's an adjustment that will just come out at the end of the year. Um, it's not something that impacts any of our funding sources right now. It really is most impactful as we're planning for next year and future years for what school choice expenditures are going to be. Have you done uh, analysis to uh, get an estimate of what our year-end balance might be under what you think it's, the conditions are? Yeah, I think we're going to end the year around 230000 Okay. And, it's, and you were planning be, uh, prior to this being more like 260, 270? Yeah, 250, 260, depending on, you know, where everything landed um, right. with expenses. So, it, you know, slightly less than what we planned on. Okay. <clears throat> we will revisit that, I assume, during the budget process. because Yeah, it, it's going to be a big discussion of our budget process. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead because I know we're going to have that conversation. So I'm happy to circle back and talk about that when that agenda item comes up, but you're absolutely right, Peter. It is a bigger discussion for next year than it is for this year. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? If not, that's all I have tonight. Can you try my audio again? I'm still not making sound. Sorry. We hear you. Yay, oh, Greg. Thank you, Kelly. Outstanding. Thank you. And thank you also, Jessica, for, for saving the day again. All right, uh, that brings us next to public comment. So I'm sure we have a number of people uh, who would like to make a comment uh, here live, and we also have some uh, written submissions. Uh, so we start with uh, people who have uh, called in live, and uh, let's see. I don't see a chat on here, but uh, all right. Uh, I see Allison Booth Mayo's hand is up. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, hello, good evening. I have a child at Sunderland Elementary and one at Frontier, and I'm a Sunderland resident. I was extremely frustrated and saddened to hear of the closure of district schools for in-person learning announced on December 10th. The Joint Boards of Health met on December 4th and determined that schools should reopen after a week-long closure following Thanksgiving break. The decision to reopen was based on an assessment that the risk to public health presented by having schools open did not warrant continued closure based on then current numbers. One statistic mentioned in the meeting was that the percentage of positive cases in school generally is actually lower than in the general population. Just six days later, the district announced that schools would be remote only until after the holidays. My understanding is that this decision was made based on a general increase in the positivity rate in Franklin County over the prior week and not on any school spread. Nor were the schools closed based on any considered decision to do so by the boards of health but rather on the district's preset health metrics that call, called for closure when certain community case thresholds were exceeded. This ongoing tussle over schools has become as much a political issue as a health issue, which I find to be completely unacceptable because it's at the children's expense. Our boards of health have not advised a school closure. The closure goes directly against guidance from the state, which indicates that schools should remain open unless there is spread within the schools. Schools are not a significant source of spread. And again, we've had zero spread within our schools. 
None of our district towns are in the red zone based on state guidance. Many medical groups and medical professionals support in-person school learning despite COVID due to the extremely negative impact of the isolation on children's well-being. Anecdotally, some medical professionals in our district have observed that, that they've seen, never seen so many cases of pediatric anxiety and depression in local emergency rooms. We are letting our children down. Our children are suffering mentally, emotionally, socially, physically, and academically. Schools are places where children not only learn academically, but where they have access to caring adults, interact socially with peers, get physical exercise, and receive emotional support where needed. My son's teacher teaches remotely from home, and I still send, send him to school because I believe the benefits of being in school far outweigh the risk of getting COVID in school. The metrics need to be changed to focus on the COVID situation within the schools, not on COVID numbers in the community at large. I urge the committee to fight for the education and general well being of Sunderland students. Please do everything in your power to allow our children to return to in person learning on January 4th. Thank you. We can't hear you, Greg, but you're just muted. You can unmute. I see, I see uh, uh, thank you. I see also Kim Sada Poulin is up next. Thank you. Uh, I'm a special education teacher at Sunderland Elementary, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be heard tonight. Uh, and also, thank you for your uh, prudent decision to temporary halt, halt in-person learning. With your decision, our hybrid non-vulnerable vulnerable learners will be only missing a total of three or four days of in-person learning before the winter break. This is a small price to pay for our community's health and safety. Just last Friday, Franklin County Public Health nurse Lisa White was quoted saying, the number of positive COVID-19 cases in Franklin County is up tremendously. In addition, Greenfield's health director, Jennifer Hoffman, was quoted, numbers are going up exponentially. The spread is widespread. And an article in this past Friday's recorder admitted the state lags in its reporting, so there could be even more cases that won't show up in the state's metrics until next week or the week after. With all this information, it was not a surprise when the communication came from Mr. Modesto last Thursday afternoon. But we as teachers knew the number of COVID cases in our community would climb. In the weeks leading up to Thanksgiving, our students shared with us their holiday plans, many of which included large gatherings of extended family and friends. We knew the numbers were going to rise. Every single one of us who works in the school wants nothing more than to be teaching our students in our classrooms face to face. This is the undeniable truth. But not when the virus numbers and hospitalizations are climbing at exponential rates. Teachers and staff of Sunderland Elementary have proven our commitment to in-person learning as our school building has been open to students since September 14th. Over a quarter of our students were identified at the beginning of the year by staff as vulnerable learners. This 29% of our school population attends the school in the building four days a week. This has been happening in Sunderland, even as many of, as, as many of our neighboring school districts have been fully remote for this entire year. We were told on December 4th at the local Board of Health meeting that it is stressful for parents to have their children learning at home. We get that. Many of us are parents in the same boat. There is no doubt this pandemic is stressful, but it doesn't have to be incapacitating or God forbid deadly to our school community. We now hear there is a petition circulating to demand that staff go back in the buildings with students at this very precarious time. 
I want to let everyone know that great teaching and learning happened the week before Thanksgiving when all our students were remote and have continued this week. Staff and students have figured remote teaching and learning out, which brings me to my request. We are asking you to trust us. We are asking you to value our health and wellness. We are asking you to keep the building temporarily closed until January 19th, when the climbing numbers from what is proving to be a risky holiday season in our Happy Valley will level out. As the events of Thanksgiving brought about a spike of which we have yet to see the scope, so will the upcoming winter holidays. At the Board of Health meeting two Fridays ago, several of the speakers brought up the importance of data. The current data, which you listen to, is telling us it is indeed time to rethink and regroup until January 19th. For the majority of our students, that will be only four in-person schooling days following the December break. Not a big ask for the health of our community. While we reflect on the data, I would like to leave you with some data of a different kind. 47% of Sunderland staff have identified as medically vulnerable but did not request a remote assignment at the beginning of the year. 42% of us have a loved one who is medically vulnerable living in our homes. 43% of our students' guardians decided at the beginning of the year to keep their students safely at home remotely learning. That number has increased to 48% in the past few weeks. I think those numbers speak volumes if we listen. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's see, uh, Victoria Palmer is up next. Uh, yes, good evening. I'm the school psychologist and the school counselor and head teacher at Sunderland School. And I wanna thank all of you for all of your service and your caring dedication to our community. The decision to move forward with remote learning now leads me and members of our community to realize you also strive to keep our students and families, our faculty and staff safe during this global health crisis. Please know we are all committed to serving our students, no matter the learning platform that is universally implemented. We care deeply about meeting student needs and each day skillfully and creatively address the needs of students because we are all committed professionals. That's why I'm speaking tonight on behalf of many of our members who eagerly ask you to place health and safety as the top priority in your decision making. Educators are heroic, but not invincible. The virus and its inevitable spread is here, requiring us to respond thoughtfully and with an abundance of caution. Municipal buildings are closed in most of our surrounding towns, and many of our neighboring school districts are fully remote and have not reopened their schools as with Union 38. Because data was cited during a recent regional local board of health meeting and used as a determination to keep our schools open, I want to share most recent information from the Centers for Disease Control and Director Robert Redfield's quote, stark warning about the worsening death toll and how this death toll has already exceeded that of the 9-11 attacks. We are beyond the 300,000 mark and it hasn't slowed, unquote. Dr. Redfield's statement sends a critical message that we must not ignore. A brutal stretch of illness is upon us now and we must act accordingly. Basic hand washing, use of disinfectants, and PPE is one element. Now we know how very essential social distancing is to prevent the virus's spread. In response to the Sunderland Board of Health Chair's recent comments 
about schools not being a source of the virus spread, I'd like to comment how controlling the contagion within schools is a very real concern shared daily by educators. Even if children are generally less susceptible, when infection surges in the surrounding community, the risks in schools can and does dramatically increase. If we cannot control the spread in the larger community, then we absolutely cannot control the spread in schools. With that information in mind, imagine listening to students describing their own recent and future holiday gatherings that include travel and visits with people outside their household. Despite repeated recommendation, it's happening in our community and we can't control it. I'm not an alarmist by nature and I have personally participated in in-person instruction in the school building since the start of the school year to experience firsthand the challenges I'm describing to you tonight. I've been very successful with remote instruction that includes reaching and teaching our most vulnerable learners. And no matter the decision tonight, I will continue to provide a safe and supportive learning experience for all our students. When I'm in school, I have worn PPE and painstakingly practiced disinfecting procedures while working with students and families of all ages and stages. In classrooms, some students take off their masks to one, scratch and blow their noses, two, while sneezing, and three, while eating lunch and snacks with their masks off for up to a 45 minute period. Windows are wide open with heat pouring out of baseboards and we are wearing coats, hats, and mittens inside the building. Would anyone feel comfortable doing that each and every day? The reality is the vaccine's approval and actual distribution will eventually help us, but absolutely not immediately. There's hope on the horizon, but still we must proceed with immense caution as we move forward through this long tunnel. Sunderland educators are scared, worried, and feel ignored. Please listen to us. January 4th feels right around the corner and too soon to safely reopen buildings. Trust that we are all doing the best we can each and every day. Tonight, I ask you to consider the health and safety of everyone in our community by keeping our school community fully embracing remote learning until careful consideration of national, local, and regional health metrics indicate returning to school is safe for all students, faculty, and staff. At the very least, the temporary time frame of mid-January is a more realistic and cautious suggestion to consider reopening. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I believe, uh, let's see, Raja uh, Prispati. Good evening, everyone. My name is Radha Prispati. I'm a grade five instructional assistant working in Sunderland Elementary School, as well as a mother of three children. My older one goes to Frontier Regional and younger one goes to Sunderland Elementary School. Today, I'm here to share how well remote learning is working for me, both as an educator as well as a parent. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank and appreciate all the committee members for considering remote learning during this tough time of the year, keeping our students, families, and community safe. Now, as a parent, I can see how hard my children teachers are working to meet their needs. They have created a structured remote learning platform. I would like to thank, uh, thank our admin teams, Mr. Borshevsky, Mr. Lenides, Mr. Dredge, and Mr. Medasto for facilitating us with remote learning technology. 
And I see that my children are completely engaged. I understand the social interaction plays a major role in student lives. We all know that. But this is not the right time for social, in social interaction, given the risk of COVID-19, which is still out there. Now, as an educator, we love our students. I can see that um, as a teacher, you know, we are, we are going above and beyond to meet their student needs. We have created a well-balanced learning environment where we are available in Google Meets during the school hours to help our students with their needs. We are using various creative tools provided by our administration team and various teaching mechanisms to keep our students engaged. At the same time, we are maintaining a balance, giving them enough screen time breaks. Mm, students are participating not only in academics, academic learning, but also in specials like PE, library, art, music, band, and strings, which is amazing. And this clearly shows that students are not missing the regular curriculum. Um, I do respect the fact that hybrid learning must be working well for some families. And I hope and wish um, we will be back in the building sometime soon. But uh, till such time, uh, we should continue to support our community for their health and safety. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh... Adria Saron. Hi. Um, first of all, the CPAC wanted to thank you guys for reaching out to us. Um, we really appreciate that you've taken our feedback and are interested in speaking with us tonight. We're really happy to be here. We also want to thank the district for providing in-person learning to the highest needs students during this current period of remote learning. This has been a lifeline to families. We had a meeting last night and hearing how much it meant to the families that were able to keep going in person is just incredible. The transition between remote and in-person learning is hard on everyone, but as we've spoken at many meetings, it's especially hard for special education families. We would like to share some systemic concerns for this committee to consider as we all move forward. There was really poor communication between the district and families regarding the Thanksgiving remote learning week. This communication has improved a lot with the most recent switch, but there's still some improvements that could be did. When the call went out last week, many special education families were not sure if their child would be in person or remote, and this caused a lot of stress for families. We have been in contact with CPACs across the state whose districts are using a tiered approach for communicating with families about special education students, and they've decided who will be in person at different times. In these districts, administrators can quickly email families to say all tier one special education students are eligible for in-person learning and can contact their liaisons to discuss their potential options. All tier two and three special education students will be learning remotely at this time. This system seems to be working well and helping a lot of families through this uncertainty of having to go back and forth between the two models. We would like this, this district to also consider 504 plan students during this process. There are a lot of children who don't have an IEP, not because they're not high needs, but because of um, there's logistical issues with an IEP meeting and getting the whole evaluation done. And some families don't even know that that's available to them. For special education students who are working remotely, whether they're on an IEP or 504, we believe that compensatory services need to be widely available without an uphill battle that families are accustomed to in this district. There are going to be times that vulnerable children will miss out on what they should be getting due to the nature of this pandemic. Families will be much more understanding if they know that extra services will be readily available this summer to make up for what's being lost right now. Beyond the educational impact, we wanna share the emotional toll on families. Disabled students rely on consistency and the sudden shift left nearly all of them struggling emotionally and behaviorally after Thanksgiving. This stress impacts both students and families for weeks. Many are still experiencing it right now. Having clear communication from the district could reduce some of this stress for families. The CPAC is asking that the district improved their communication so that special education families would know what to expect when remote learning is implemented. We also ask that the district make a commitment to ensure that COVID compensatory services are readily available 
to ensure a more equitable experience for all special education students. We thank you for your time and your continued collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I see that uh, Carrie McGrath also wishes to speak. Hi, um, my name is Carrie McGrath and I teach fourth grade at SES. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm relieved to be working remotely this week and next week. And I would like to encourage the school committee to keep us remote for two weeks following December break. Um, when the board, local boards of health decided to keep us remote for the week following Thanksgiving, it was my understanding that this was to allow the board's time to review the COVID-19 numbers that came out after the Thanksgiving holiday. But during the post Thanksgiving meeting of the boards of health, it was communicated that they didn't expect to receive those Thanksgiving related numbers until much later. It took less than an additional week for numbers in our community to grow large enough for us to go fully remote again. Our students and their families are likely to gather with family and friends over December break and maybe to travel. I think that we should learn from our Thanksgiving experience and stay remote for those first two weeks of January. Of course, we all eagerly look forward to the day when we can be safely back in school. However, the remote model has some significant advantages. Being remote allows us consistency and the ability to work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Um, it allows us to spend less time on hand washing and enforcing social distancing and more time on learning and relationships. Never before have I been able to dedicate so much of my teaching time to academics rather than addressing behavioral issues. Across the board, my students are progressing at an impressive pace. We have a solid routine and a consistent structure to our days. My students have strong relationships with each other and with me, and that has been uninhibited by the remote format. If anything, I find it easier to connect with my students on remote days, given the constraints on in-person learning this year. The vast majority of my students are able to work independently throughout the day, solving problems for themselves or getting help from me. I'm sure they find their parents to request snacks or lunch during breaks, but beyond that, they are occupied with meaningful learning activities from the start to the end of the school day. Every day, I am amazed by how hardworking and engaged my students are. I know some students struggle with the remote model, just as some students struggle when they are in person under normal circumstances. But for many of our students, the remote model is working extremely well. For all of these reasons, I strongly encourage this committee to consider keeping our school remote for two weeks following the December break and to reevaluate at that time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. And it looks as if there's a Jody Fraser. Fraser wishes to speak up. So uh, it, my name is Victoria Palmer, and I've been asked to speak tonight on behalf of Jody, who uh, had an incident that uh, interfered with her being here in person. So she has prepared a statement and sent it to me. And I'd like to read this statement on behalf of Jody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I want to start by saying thank you for doing the safe thing and having schools go fully remote through the holiday break. I appreciate you putting the health and safety of our students and staff first. With that being said, I am asking that you keep school fully remote until at least January 19th. This would allow us to know if there will be another spike in cases due to the holiday season. Thank you for your service to our community. Outstanding. All right. Um, so we have a few written submissions. Uh, and I, I think uh, in the future, I'll probably we'll have to hand some of these out if we get more. Um, but uh, why don't I just read them, if I may. Uh, we have one from uh, an Amanda who didn't leave a last name. Hello, Donna. I wanted to express my honest and humble concern we have had as a mother of two students with different needs, both attending Sunderland Elementary School. One of my girls is three uh, years old with ASD and my other daughter, 12 years old with ADHD. We chose remote learning for both children this year uh, for a variety of mostly obvious reasons. Uh, the transition in September for my 12 year old was unbelievably difficult. One uh, Chromebook was dropping signal in the middle of most classes making it impossible to attend. 
to no daily or weekly schedule uh, when Chromebook dropped uh, her to know where to go next. Three, she cried most days with frustration of not being able to do the work or uh, the inability uh, to attend long enough to do the work. And four, the process uh, and lack of school support made us choose to homeschool her this academic school year. My three-year-old's three transition with uh, ASDS was a nightmare. We are still trying to fine-tune our plan. In short, one, had a meeting in August about her remote plan. None of what we discussed uh, was added. Two, finally received a learning plan, uh, 10 6, 20, draft only. Three, no learning devices to access services until end of October. Four, the Google Classrooms are only updated weekly. There are no daily activities. Five, accessibility to the classrooms are inconsistent. Six, our Google Calendar has been uh, empty since the beginning of the year. Seven, uh, finally starting to receive services. Eight, uh, we had to use outside services because the school has not provided them. Uh, we would have loved more continuity and stability with the school's uh, systems plans for this academic school year. I believe that the school systems had the ability to have a stronger plan to empower children and their families to transition into a more permanent and concrete plan more fluently. Thank you for your time and including a special education student in your meeting. Sincerely, Amanda. All right. We have a, uh, a submission from Hillary uh, Slautsky. Um, Dear school committee members, thank you in advance for your time and consideration of this request. I ask that the school committee consider keeping open the internet cafe program. Even if Sunderland Elementary uh, otherwise has to be fully remote, the internet cafe at the school building has been providing four days of in-person supervised and additional support for vulnerable learners and those who for a variety of reasons are unable to progress adequately at home. The consequences of moving to fully remote systems are much more negative for this subset of students. Sincerely, uh, Hilary Slotsky, parent of two SES students. And finally, uh, Sarah Colsey. Um, first, I would like to thank you for listening to my comments and for your continued support of our schools and community. When schools went back to remote Thursday, it was a massive blow to a lot of us parents, and in particular, our children. Many of us feel this is not the right thing to do, and we cannot support remote learning anymore. Our children are uh, hurting big time. Day in, day out, we're watching our children struggling with technology issues, lack of peer interaction, a need for uh, in-person teachers and structure. I know many children who spend days crying because they just uh, don't want to be on a computer anymore. My sixth grader needs constant supervision to stay in his seat and keep on task. Kids are frustrated, teachers are frustrated, and parents are as well. Thursday afternoon, I heard from a lot of my friends, fellow parents, and community members about how they don't know uh, what to do anymore. Some of them are on the verge of losing their jobs. Single parents in particular can't keep taking time off from work. They have no vacation time and no sick time left. Very shortly, unemployment benefits are going to run out for a lot of people. And sadly, that is their only source of income right now. Some were trying to go back to work while their children were in school. I know that people have uh, caught the virus in our school community, and I know this is a scary virus to people, but we can't live in a constant what-if state of fear. Uh, we have shown the schools are safe with no transmission in the schools. Our children were doing everything they were told to do, and it was uh, working. DES has said to go back uh, four days a week. On uh, Friday, I posted a petition asking parents, students, and community members to sign if they felt their children should go back to school. This petition was posted uh, in three Facebook groups and linked directly to our schools and community. Within an hour, 50 people had signed over the weekend. It went up to over 210 signatures uh, in just three days. And she provides a link. Uh, as was said in the Board of Health meeting last week, uh, there's a large uptick in children being hospitalized for mental health issues. Multiple physicians and news outlets have written articles about how dangerous it's getting and how we need to be worried about uh, not just how. Uh, not just now, but the future. What are the long-term issues our children will face with being secluded, lack of social interaction, loss of learning, and the constant fear they're witnessing and living with? Parents and community members, uh, mental health is also suffering. Uh, we are taking on roles that we are not prepared for. We are juggling, uh, helping multiple children in multiple grade schools, in our homes, uh, and at the same time with school. 
We are worried about financial concerns, job loss, and of course, health concerns, not just COVID related. Uh, people are angry, lashing out. Cyberbullying is at an extremely high level right now. Over the last three days, I've been called a teacher killer, a child killer, a lunatic, and a racist for posting that petition from people in our community. These uh, hateful and disgusting comments are coming from adults. When our children are, are in school, they are learning more, they are socializing more, and they're engaging more. They are not forced uh, on a computer screen for seven hours a day, uh, and most importantly, they are happy. My family and those that have signed the petition have asked the hybrid model uh, be reinstated immediately. We are feel for, fearful for our children, their futures, our community, if we just keep it shut down. Thank you for your time. All my best, Sarah Klausi, a parent of a Frontier and DES student. All right. And I think that concludes the public comment. Let's see. All right. Um, we have we have unfinished business, and uh, the next item on the agenda is the anti-racism and equity committee update. Mr. But Chair. I wonder if we're interested in keeping the thread going. We should uh, continue on with a COVID nineteen update first. Go ahead, Peter. I, I just I, I just want to say thank you for the people that took the time to come and comment here or send stuff in. Um, obviously, there are mixed feelings on all of this and very strong held feelings. Also, um, you know, all I can say is that from my own perspective, uh, I've said before, I feel all this is very, it tears at me in terms of what we're deciding. Uh, my own personal theory is you do the best you the best you can every day. Every time you're forced to make a decision, you do the best you can. And you move on. You don't forget what happened. You look back always at what happened in terms of what you can learn from it, but you move on because you can only affect what you're going to do in the future. Um, but I, so, you know, I imagine we're going to have, you know, this is, this is going to keep going all this school year because the COVID is not suddenly going to disappear. Um, but in all of this, hearing from people who are on the front line, in effect, um, either as parents and, and their kids or as teachers and the staff and so on, um, helps us understand what the, is going on. And so I just want to thank you for the people that take the trouble to communicate with us and um, do so, uh, you know, they express themselves very well and, this, and the strength of the feelings is very clear. Um, it's sad that, you know, we have such uh, divergent feelings, but this is not an easy time and we just have to try and deal with it the best we can. So thank you. Well said. All right. Um, again, continuing the thread, should we uh, move to the COVID-19 update next? And uh, sounds sounds reasonable. Darius, is that you? Sure. Um, I think uh, I think I think uh, Peter kind of summarized the. Whoop. I, I got uh, Ben was raising his hand. What's going on, Ben? Okay. Yeah, uh, Kelsey Crop is here to join us to give the the update for the oh, yeah. uh, anti-racism and equity committee. Hi, Kelsey. Hello. Is that okay if I kind of jump in and? Yeah, yeah, let's, we, we're going to switch the agenda, but, but go ahead. Let's let's uh, let's take a breather. All right, um, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, and I also want to say, you know, hearing you hearing all all of the things that are going on, and um, I think it's a huge credit to our schools and our community that the anti-racism initiative has not fallen by the wayside this year. Um, it would have been very easy for us to say, you know what, there's too much on our plate. We've got too much else going on. We'll worry about that next year. Um, and we really haven't. We've stuck to our commitment. We're moving forward. Um, and I think that, that that is a credit to to us and to our community. Um, so for professional development, um, the high school just concluded their first semester professional development um, with Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass. And that has been um, predominantly focused on personal work, personal identity work, understanding our own identities, 
um, and how that relates to our roles and our communities. Um, and then in the second semester, we'll be looking more at what does that mean in the classroom? Um, and how do we start having those conversations with our students about their identities and what that means um, with how they might relate to the world and to those around them. Um, the elementary school is, schools um, are, have been following sort of the same model where for the fall, they did a lot of um, education and self work. And then, so they've concluded that um, for the fall semester. And then in the spring semester, they'll be doing um, some more professional development focused more on implementation in the classroom. Um, so that's sort of, that was sort of the vision for this year. It was in the fall, we'll focus on sort of work for the staff and then the spring moving into, okay, now how do we implement this in the classroom? For curriculum, um, over at Frontier, the eighth grade is I think a little, a little over halfway through with um, the junior edition of Stamped. Um, there's been a little bit of pushback, but overall that's been very positive. Um, there have been some really fruitful conversations happening in classrooms. Students have really been digging into the material um, and engaging in some, some really thoughtful conversations. Um, and we're also hearing feedback that those conversations are traveling home and that families are starting to have some of these um, engaging conversations, which is exactly what we want. We want this to be bigger than just our schools. We want this to be our communities. Um, at the elementary level, we have a glossary of terms that's been created. Um, so the thought being that there are lots of different ways to define a lot of these terms. Um, so if we're all using the same definition, then all of our students will know when we say a certain word, like, okay, when we say gender, this is what we mean. Um, so that everyone's kind of on the same page. We're all coming from the same the same place when we're starting to talk about some of these concepts when they get into middle school and high school. Um, the elementary committee has also selected five books per grade level um, specifically for diversity um, and uh, racial perspective. So those books will start to become available in the classrooms in the spring semester as the elementary schools start to do their professional development with classroom implementation. For our school culture committee, um, we have an update from the FERCOG Communities That Care Coalition. Um, so they have a grant called Advancing Anti-Racism in Schools. So they will be coming in in January to do an assessment for us, um, looking at what do we already have in place and where are some of the gaps and weaknesses um, to kind of help us really pinpoint some areas for improvement. And in February, they'll be doing some focus groups with students to kind of hear from their perspective. What are the things that you really like about your school? What are the things um, that you wish maybe were a little bit different? Um, the logo for Frontier um, is going to be unveiled in January. So we're very excited about that. Um, and the peer leadership group is, we're actually meeting tomorrow um, to launch some discussion um, discussion forums when we get back from the break. So those will all be virtual and those will be opportunities um, for students who are interested in talking a little bit more, um, who are ready to start having some more, some deeper conversations um, that they can drop into these spaces and talk with their peers uh, with some adult supervision um, and really start digging into these topics. For the school policy, subcommittee, um, they have been working on recommendations for revisions to the student handbook. And at this point, they've identified some sections that they'd actually like some student input on, um, wanting these documents to really be living documents that the students are involved with instead of kind of, you know, these things that are just kind of hanging out that no one ever looks at. Um, and they'll also be sending out a staff survey to check for understanding about how we deal with um, incidences of hate speech so that we're all on the same page and we can kind of, we can identify if there are any gray areas and make sure that we're all um, clear on what that protocol is. Um, and I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Anyone? Thanks so much, Kelsey. I just wanted to, right. I just wanted to just echo what Kelsey started off with that, um, amongst all the, the stressors of, of the um, COVID and all the other kind of things going on, the amount of progress we've made due to the hard work um, of this of, of Kelsey and her committee um, is just in, 
it's just been, it's been it's been wonderful and i just wanted to kind of i just wanted to echo that because it was very easy it could have very easily we could have put this on the back back burner and we have not so i just want to say thank you and, and recognize that again absolutely yeah that goes across the board and even for the whole school improvement plan which we're, we're going to get to shortly um all right so we had started briefly down the road of a COVID-19 update. Um, Greg, just, I, I, no, just to, I know you guys um, I want to make sure we do this properly. There are two names on the list that Donna sent me for public comment. And I believe, I don't know if the gentleman is still here, but there was a John, um, hang on, the name list I had, a John Bagden and a Melissa okay. Bergeron were two other names that were on the list. I think John was sitting there. And I want to make sure that we make sure that everybody who signed up gets, gets to call on. Um, then I can do my jump in, but I got a, I I got a text saying we missed I somebody. Think, <laughs> I think he may have stepped off and, uh, oh, no, there he is. By all means, if we missed, uh, so, so John, please go ahead. Oh, unmute. John, if you're on your phone, star six might work. Or it might boot you off, I'm not sure. How about that? That work? All right. I'm Jonathan Bagden. I have a kindergartner. And if you, as any of you know, it's pretty hard to hold a six-year-old, any, any regular six-year-old. But the problem I have with the remote is it's just, you know, it's 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 tough on us, you know, to have uh, a child who likes gaming on a computer and likes playing, you know, playing games and talking to family and stuff like that. But as soon as the teacher comes on there, and as soon as you have a little bit of a uh, little bit of work to do, yeah, that, that that completely goes out the window. So with the fact that there's only a few special needs, you know, for the one on ones, the stuff like my kid. It seems like uh, with the with the fact that we haven't really had many cases or any any close to the uh, closely related to the school, if any of our if if the board of health we could get the green light to have our little guys you know the special needs kid that that, that come on leaps and bounds with in person and completely just you know completely uh, wrong word I'm looking for but they. They, uh, the online learning just does not work for them, and that's that's pretty much all I had to say. I I didn't know everybody's going to be uh, uh, written up three page uh, prepared reports here. So, <laughs> no, appreciate appreciate the variety of, uh, of perspectives. Yeah, but that's all I had. So, you know, some some of our kids, you know, they respond well to the teachers, and the teachers are our family friends. They're you know they they learn well from in person and you know like my my older two i'll give you for, for a prime example my older two they're doing completely fine even when i went to the pediatricians i'm kind of uh, aggravated about they tried to push and say do you have that they, they actually asked them and says they wanted to try and get them to say that they had anxiety from in-person learning and i wasn't there for that and coming from a I should I shouldn't say it because it's going to call him out. But coming from an eleven year old, I didn't appreciate that at all. So it's just you know things like that that uh, it's just I just I, I can't handle. But with the special needs little guys, you know some some of them, you know from from a parent's perspective, they're doing very very well at school and are completely horrible on the computer. But that's all I had. Thank you. Darius, Thank you. What was the second name? Uh, Melissa Bergeron. Do we have a Melissa Bergeron? Um, Melissa's asked me to speak up on her behalf. Apparently, she sent in some um, written comments to you. Um, if you don't have them accessible, she's just now sent them to me, and I could read them. Please do. Okay, just one moment. Let me bring that up. Are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. 
Uh, she says, good afternoon. I wanted to take a moment to send this comment to the school committee concerning discussions on what school will look like for our children after the holiday break. I need to express my opinion that children need to be back in school full time. My son was fortunate enough to be able to attend four full days a week starting in October because he was a kindergarten student. I cannot express enough how much this opportunity improved his experience with school and with his peers. Why have they, they been able to return and not older children? A recent survey in the middle and high school highlighted how not being in school is affecting our children emotionally. This is honest feedback from teens. I cannot imagine how our younger students are dealing with this isolation. When my middle school age child is able to attend in person learning twice a week, her whole attitude changes. She is so happy and excited for a small bit of normalcy and to learn in an environment that is much more comfortable than the online environment. Remote learning is also affecting our community on a socioeconomic level. Some children's parents are forced to work and cannot afford to send their children to costly daycare in situations where remote learning can be supervised. There is an opportunity for them to fall behind and that is not fair. I know we are scared, but science is showing us that children do not spread the virus at the rates adults do. We are also lucky to live in less populated areas and have smaller class sizes and can accommodate social distancing. I've seen this model work for kindergartners. If five-year-olds can safely wear masks, social distance, and wash hands, so can other elementary students. I think it is important for our children to have a chance to attend school. Please consider this as you make your decisions. Melissa. Thank you. And thank you, Allison, for reading that. All right. So was there uh, anything else uh, that uh, I don't know? I see Meg is here. Uh, ben, Darius, anything you guys wanted to say? I'm, well, I mean, I can talk about like next steps where we're kind of going from here is, I, I would, would be the assumption. I think the... Uh, I do think public the public comment gave a I think a pretty I would say almost balanced summary of where we're at. You know, we're we're between two different kind of viewpoints in our community, um, and um, you know, obviously, you know, it's a it's a difficult. I'm kind of saying it this way, but this is me after days and days of stress of each each and every email I read, and um, even last week as we went through the process of uh, going to remote. Um, I mean, where we're at now is I'm I'm currently building. Um, looking at our metrics and our health metrics and also going to be talking with the associations um, about the metrics in our, um, I'm, I'm not just me, I'm looking at Nurse Meg at the same time, um, just helping put together metrics and, and really looking at, I see we're entering kind of a new phase. We, we were very fortunate this fall not to have cases. And I think um, when we started having case after case coming in in November, and then we saw the spike after, um, you know, the week falling um, after Thanksgiving, we, we saw the tremendous spike in Franklin County. Um, we've never kind of been there. And I think other places across the state have been there where they've had community spread and they've had to adjust their schools to a different type of, um, I would say mentality. It's, you know, and metrics are gonna be difficult to balance versus, you know, school, you know, school exposure and school spread. And I think that's what the next step has to be built. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I hear the parents and I hear the teachers and I understand both sides very clearly. You know, as a parent, I want my child in school as much as possible. As teachers, I also know we have a responsibility um, to, to balance safety as well. So I see it and I, and I think trying to find an avenue forward um, is gonna have to be really, I think be really, really looking at, you know, fact-based um, and um, building from there. So the idea right now is that um, we are building those metrics. Um, there is a, Currently, right now, the next meeting to discuss this would be with the Board of Health on the 29th. Um, and that would be also looking at that time, looking at where our 
you know, where the community metrics are in the sense of where that metric community data is, you know, you know, have we, you know, did we have a spike, you know, are we starting to come back down from it at that point? Um, is there a continued spike following the holidays? Is it, you know, stabilized, you know, the numbers to go any which way. Um, and, you know, looking at that at that particular point in time and making decisions about the fourth at that time is, uh, is the current plan on the table um, that I have, that I have put forward. So, um, I guess I, I say that to you because you folks are also yeah. the planners um, as well. So that's kind of where I am sitting administratively. I do have to say that we, it's gotten it's gotten very complicated in my seat because there are now um, 37 people involved with this decision as official, as official public body members. I got 12 um, board of health members and I have 25 school committee members. Okay, so it's very trying to wrap that around and obviously. Um, you know the the uh, the voices from our community as well. So it's very um, it's complicated, and, and I guess in hindsight, we could have set it up differently. You know, also in hindsight, I also have to say we had a we had a very good run up to this point, and I, I do want to I want to celebrate that at one point because I think it was it was mentioned in one of the public comments tonight that you know um, you look at our neighboring districts who have been unable to get as far as we've gotten. Uh, with in-person learning. I just want, want to recognize that and thank everybody who's been um, getting us to that point because I think there is there is a, um, in behind closed doors, we, we were wondering if we we're going to make it to October, given, you know, we didn't know what to expect. We made it flying through October, strong into November, and then things started to, we started getting cases. And so now we have to to build what is the, what is the, what is working in a COVID environment instead of, you know, um, look like and, you know, how much change do we need to do um, for that. So I guess that's kind of where I'm at. And I guess, you know, we can ask questions and have conversation. And I don't know um, if I say anything that's Nurse Meg, if I, Meg, I really calls you Nurse Meg. But Meg, if you have anything, I don't call you that behind the scenes. Um, Meg, if you have anything that, um, you know, I missed or kind of want to chime in there or Ben, that kind of thing. But and then obviously it's your meeting, folks. You can yeah. have your questions. <clears throat> the only thing I would just comment, and um, this, this I was pretty proud of, our our staff and students and um, is that, you know, for the cases we did have within the district, um, none of those in, uh, were, um, came from the school and there was no transmission related to any of those cases in our schools. Um, and in a couple of those instances, we found out about somebody who was asymptomatic, which is was sort of the big fear. I know a lot of people had concerns and brought those concerns to me early in the process. Um, and you know, I, I think that it speaks volumes to the fidelity of everybody in terms of following um, the protocols we do have in place. Um, and the cases that we're seeing in the community are from um, adults, uh, social gathering, um, and, and to some degree workplace exposures, um, but the biggest really is um, people not following the, the, the state recommended precautions. So, um, Anyway, I just I I'm gonna go back to the positive, which was <laughs> that um, that in all the contact tracing I did, and I I did talk um, in great length with all of the public health nurses involved, um, and you know to be certain and do the reverse uh, tracing to to identify where somebody had had become infected, and it had nothing to do with our schools. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, yeah, I just want to add uh, so. Uh, Darius obviously was under a lot of pressure and juggling a number of things, and uh, we we had this upcoming uh, meeting, so we thought we'd uh, air these issues here rather than to try to pull something uh, emergency because it seemed to be a, a district-wide issue. Um, I will say absolutely, uh, I, you know, personally, it, it wasn't just the levels and the fact that the levels were sort of unprecedented for our area, but uh, we're seeing spikes in the number of new cases and of, you know, the, the stress on the system and the amount of stuff in the environment, uh, the amount of COVID in the environment is a function of uh, the rate of new cases spread over a couple of weeks. So it's sort of a leading indicator. And as people pointed out, there's a little bit of lag to this leading indicator because it takes a while for symptoms and testing to show up. So it, it really was that, that rapid onset of, uh, spikes in the new cases where uh, I was comfortable saying, uh, we're not going to know exactly what this means for uh, 
a few days. And so I, I was supportive of the decision to, uh, to go remote uh, until the holidays. I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything. I have a yes. question about the revision process. Um, ha, who will be involved in that? Will it be a public process? Um, and in general, I would like to just express, I have concerns about the transparency that has gone into, with the Board of Health into implementing the metrics. You know, I've, I've heard the response that, you know, they're in daily communication. It's sort of an emergency situation if you're gonna have a closure, you know, and so some of these conversations are not happening in public meetings, but you know, we did surpass, we did pass some of the metrics and there was no communication about that and why we were not closing when they had the, the big public meeting was a, a week and a half ago. Um, they didn't revote. They said we already decided this two weeks ago. So why weren't what what was the data at that point? Like it, I just want to know what the decisions are being based on. And I feel like we haven't gotten that explanation from the Board of Health. So, sorry, my original question was, what is going to ha who is going to do the revision and what will the process look like? The metrics were created by the school as part of our back to school opening plan. And so, and then we, and those plans were developed with, um, um, you know, by our school and then with the associations. And so talking with our teachers and the teachers were on different committees and, and nursing staff and such um, to building those metrics. Um, so, you know, we're going we're building a, a draft of those metrics and then they were approved by the Board of Health because the Board of Health is the one that was taking action on those metrics. Um, the Board of Health, and now I'm speaking for the Board of Health, and so I got to be careful. I'm going to give you my interpretation just for clear for the record. My interpretation of the Board of Health was that they were looking at the numbers, they were looking at our metrics, which basically said that when we broke the metrics, it, we had to have consult with the Board of Health. Okay, and so we broke some of the overall, the, I think the first metric that was broken was the number of cases within Franklin County in a 14 day period. Or actually probably the first metric that was broken was the state red designation in Sunderland where, um, I don't know, was a red you know, case and, and um, it was based, based primarily out of college students. And that was probably a very good example of the Board of Health looking at the numbers and then looking at the exact people that were infecting them and saying, this is not community spread. This is a portion of our community that is not part of our, you know, connect to our school community. And so therefore they made a decision that there was no reason to act on those metrics um, to close school. Um, later, the, um, so what you were talking about these, I guess you could say um, non-transparent meetings that what the Board of Health had set up was a, a bi-weekly phone call um, with all the emergency personnel. And usually I think this is a uh, extension of how they set up flu clinics and they do other boards of health business the four towns and so what we did is they expanded on to talking about the schools and early on the conversation about schools is very short those conversations started getting longer and longer and then you know we um out of those decisions became a decision that we started talking about whether or not we were going to close after thanksgiving and um you know i said that you know basically we need to have a conversation that has to be a public conversation so that people can see the transparency there you know i don't control the boards of health and again as i talk about kind of in the middle because um, they have been they have been wonderful to work with in the sense that we have to have a lot of conversations. Meg's on the conversation with um, them even more than myself. Um, and so it's it's important to that we work together. I will say that you know on uh, one of the meetings the transparency that the decision they said it was already the decision being already made was that they were going to continue and not um, go go to the remote model and then they took public comment afterwards. I think um, people would say that you know that was not in it was not in the best form that they should have taken in um, public comment. Um, I think part of it is a learning curve for them um, in the sense that they haven't been on the front lines as the school committee has in dealing with the public straight up on such a or maybe they didn't realize that I don't know you know I, um, I'm not gonna make excuses for them. I'm just trying to give perhaps reasons. Um, so. Anyway, I'm kind of getting lost in my own thoughts. So they started doing more you know, public meetings on, on those things. And that's when they discussed last Friday, that was a public meeting where they were on a Thursday meeting and they just said that they, um, they didn't have a full quorum in that meeting. They were just discussing the numbers. And I said, you need to have a full meeting on that. And that's when it happened on a Friday afternoon because they had a meeting on a Thursday. And so the, the, the call was, so we said, you know what, you really need to have a, a public meeting so people can weigh in. 
Um, and that was that short turnaround and people were upset it was a Friday evening and why was it at the end of the week? But, you know, basically they were trying to look at the numbers at the end of the week, closest to the start of the following week. And so, um, you know, and that, that kind of meeting was history. Um, going into the following week, um, which was last week, um, the numbers started to rise. And then Wednesday we got the report that all of our metrics were broken um, with the, the most recent, you know, surge, I guess we'll call it. Um, I don't know if it's officially a surge, but we call it a surge and are looking at it. And um, I looked at the metrics and said that we need to do some action here because those metrics were, while we were using the Board of Health, and this is where, you know, I, you know, um, where leadership steps up and whether I'm right or wrong in that, um, I believe this is where the two sides come came together where we created metrics to keep our community staff and community safe. Um, and we had kind of blown by all of them. Not only did we go over the last one, but the ones that we had already stepped over had even further increased, you know, by, you know, two or three fold. And so it really was a surge. And so the decision that I felt at that point was this was an agreement we made with, um, you know, our, our teaching staff, I guess, and community. Teaching staff obviously are going to know more about it because they've been a part of those decision making about what is the safety parameters being put into place um, to open up school. And then we, you know, we did, again, and just pointed out, we did modify those parameters as we went along um, as well. And so, um, you know, that's, that was the, that was the reason for it is that we did have a spike and we are seeing cases, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about. And I'm only saying this so you have an understanding of the, the seat that I, myself and Meg are in, is that we're in the middle of also tracking a bunch of cases at the same time and a bunch of, at the, you know, tracking cases at the at the footstep of our school. And those numbers were going through the roof too and about the number of cases that were being tracked in our community. And I, in the past, I had always stood here and, and said, we don't have community said, spread. In October, when we didn't close down, um, we didn't close down uh, Sunderland, you know, I basically, you know, I saw here and I, and I stood by those, the decision because there was not community spread. You know, we now have community spread. You know, and there was a it was in a spike of community spread, and so you know with that we I thought we need to relook at the metrics, and I think Greg kind of put it out there too. There's an emotional side of this, and the emotional safety of people. People were on edge, um, and um, it was kind of felt, in my perspective, um, things became unraveled. Um, you know that we were you know, and so. Whether or not we looked the, you know, where I was, and I guess, and I received some flack for this, that perhaps we could have, you know, again looked at the numbers the following week. That would have been a data-driven decision. Um, the start and stop, you know, now that we're gonna have snow in the middle of next the end of this week, I guess it would have been kind of maybe a moot point. But, you know, um, I guess I struggle with that one. I also apologize that people did say, you know, you let us know on Friday in the afternoon. These are the emails I'm getting, and to all people to hear that I'm hearing them, and I take them to heart, probably a little bit too much to my heart. Um, that that, you know, you gave us less than 24 hour notice to go remote, you know, we see our family lives upside down. But um, in essence, I made that decision because um, either we are at a high health emergency or not, you know, either the spike is out of control or it's not going another day um, where we had a major outbreak because of a Friday of being in because, you know, that's where my mindset was um, in that being the case. And so, and I did not make it in isolation. I called all chairs, I called all the boards of health. I talked with, you know, I talked with, I talked with everybody. I mean, it was a long, multiple times, some people even multiple times. So, um, you know, this is the, you know, this is how we ended up where we're at, um, but we were based off those metrics um, there. So the question was, what are the metrics changing moving forward? So, um, you know, uh, Megan and I have meetings, um, meeting tomorrow to go through the metrics with teaching staff, um, with the union rather, and to take a first look at what, they, what the current ones are. We have some proposed new ones. We also have to, Metrics, I think, Meg, you kind of done a better job of talking about this, so I'm going to give you a second to think about it. Um, but, you know, Meg and I had a conversation today. Metrics are tough. Like, which number of data are you looking at? What does it mean? You know, when you look at percent, I'll give an example. Like, you know, you look at percent positive, which was one of the numbers, that last numbers that was broken in Franklin County. It doubled in one week's time. You know, why did it double? You know, we received information afterwards that possibly that double mm -hmm. could have happened because Deerfield Academy and Eagle Brook stopped testing. And they were doing, you know, hundreds of tests at those those institutions. Mm -hmm. um, that could have had a hand in it. It was clearly an uprise in cases as well. But then when you look at town numbers, if you look at town percentage, Waitley was over five percent, but they only have they have less than five cases. You know what I mean? So it, it doesn't it, it does, the stats don't work on some particular numbers to some things. So finding metrics that make sense, um, we've learned a lot. 
I think as well. And we've learned a lot as we, even as we updated them, um, I think we just weren't ready for the, the, the massive uptick all at once um, with those metrics, you know, um, for me, we were, and that's what those metrics were for. You know, they were the indicator that said, Hey, um, you know, slow down here. So Meg, I, I'm starting to ramble. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I was thinking that, you know, we've, we've talked at different times about, um, about context of the data and, you know, one of, one of the challenges of, you know, you, you, you look at statewide or county level data and it doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening in our schools. Um, one of the days when there was very high cases last week, there was a, a large number of those cases over half were related to a congregate setting. Um, we couldn't know that the day that data came out. Um, that didn't that didn't directly impact our school. And so I think one of the things that we're really trying to tease out is how do we use the data that are available? Um, how do we put it in in the context of what do we know about what's in our school? What do we know in terms of what's happening in the community? Um, what can we do? What can we look to in terms of risk assessment and the epidemiology um, of COVID um, and COVID transmission? And how do we how do we also keep as part of any decision some some indicators that really tell us what's happening in the school um, and in in the school community um, numbers are going to go up in in the communities and um, a, when you when you look at the daily dashboard the majority of the cases for weeks and weeks have now been in the the 20 to 29 year old age group um, as the most cases um, there are certainly plenty of other cases in other age groups, including young age groups, but uh, the data are showing that kids aren't bringing the, the coat into the house. It's, it's the family members bringing it into the house where kids are getting infected. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it's some of the data that we're going to be looking at are the same data sources because there's just not other data out there. We, we have what's available to us. Um, no school in this commonwealth has the capacity to do their own data analysis um, where we've had ideas and we've tried to think about how can we interpret the data i've reached out to um, one of the epidemiologists at the public health institute of western mass um, to say you know can can we use the data this way or that way um, to try to see again to see sort of what's what's the most we can squeeze out of the data that are available I think we're going to have to look at um, we're going to have to look at our internal data um, as well, and and come up with something that that feels like an appropriate measure um, of of what's the what's the what's the reality of COVID in our schools, um, and you know a lot of times we you know I hear anecdotally you know of cases that are outside of this uh, in remote learners um, or in, you know, families that are, uh, are not coming into the building at all. And those, you know, we, we can ask to be, you know, have that information, but it doesn't directly impact the school. Um, and I would just want to comment, you, you know, I, I appreciate your, your concern and, and, um, and request for transparency. And I think one of the things that can be hard from my perspective, in terms of the public health piece of it is that there's times where what, what the information we can get from health nurse um, or nurses is limited, um, appropriately so. Um, so one of the things that can make this more challenging and I think adds to the emotional component for some people is the rumors. Um, you know, I, I've <laughs> I spent a lot of time over the last few weeks kind of not necessarily debunking, but just having to sort of say, mm, that's not information that I've had confirmed by a public health nurse. Um, and that just makes the whole thing more challenging. Um, so it's hard. I don't, I mean, that doesn't, I don't know if it fully answers your question, um, but I think that, um, what, you know, so we, we know far more than we did. Huh? Jessica, Jessica, what I don't have is I don't know how the next step. So the idea is that we we develop this, come to some general agreement um, to move forward. 
And then it goes forward to, it has to go forward to the boards of health. This is going to be public health metrics, but at the same time, it also has to go to school committee. And I'll be honest with you, that part I haven't had figured out yet. Cause I don't know if we do, this is where I come at the 37 number of, of people. <laughs> like, do we have, do, I, I think a lot of the school committee is going to be at the, the 29th meeting, right? 29th. I wrote it down. I keep on yeah. saying the 20, it is the 29th. I said the 28th at several times and I apologize, but it's Tuesday, the 29th. It has to be on a Tuesday because the select board's meeting on Monday. So, um, and I wonder if it should be a joint meeting, but then all of a sudden you have 37 people in a meeting. I mean, you got to have Senate rules. You know what I mean? Like, it's, so it's, you know, those kind of things. So, or do we do a meeting afterwards, a joint meeting afterwards? So that part I haven't really aired out yet because I don't actually, you know, one, I guess I'm trying to get one step at a time. I also need feedback because you guys also gather when, when you have meetings and that kind of thing. And it's also during vacation. I know that's not pleasant, it, you know, some people, I don't know if anybody's going away, but, um, you know, the, the, that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's causes, you know, that kind of thing is happening as well. So I don't have that part started out, but I do need some direction on that or suggestion on that as well. So, um, and I have to reach out to all five committees on that. <clears throat> so can I make two <laughs> to this? Number one, when you, when you do know what the process for the metrics revision will be like, will you update us even if it's between meetings? Yeah. And then number two, a request for what might go into those measures. I, I, I just helped rewrite the metrics for the Hatfield Public Schools. I, I know all of these issues really well of what you're saying about how challenging it is, Meg. Um, uh, I, I hope that the new policy will have something, some transparency, some accountability written into it, whether it is the public gets to see minutes of the consult with the Board of Health, or if there's going to be maybe a weekly report published of wh where is the current data in relation to the metrics that have been agreed upon. Um, but we, in this district, we don't yet have a record of showing the public what is going into making the decisions. That's all. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Peter? You're muted. Sorry, I just want to understand the process. The process is that on the 29th, there's a Board of Health meeting where the school committee people will probably be there, but it's a Board of Health meeting, and the Board of Health meeting will either decide to continue with the plan, which is to reopen schools on the 4th, or some other option, which could be, you know, either a defined, either a stay with remote of some defined length or a stay with remote, you know, indefinitely. I mean, those to me are the options. I don't think going at that point, right, the full person or right to the next phase is likely to happen and um, so on. But um, if the Board of Health votes to delay going back to hybrid, uh, to a date later than the plan, currently planned January 4th, um, that's something that we as a school committee can't vote to say, now nah, we're going to go ahead and go back to hybrid anyway. I mean, they have the they have the authority there to say the schools need to be closed. Isn't that correct? Yeah, so they have the authority to, they have the authority to close schools. Right, so that if they decide on the 29th that school needs to be closed for longer than reopening on the 4th. You know, it's not like we need an emergency meeting. We can't have an emergency meeting in order to override that or anything like that. We just carry on. Um, isn't that correct? But, the, but the, you have the opposite. So the school committee can change the teaching model and you wouldn't be closing the schools due to a health reason. You'd be closing the schools due to whatever other reason. I mean, I guess you could say it's even a health reason, but you're not closing in the same authority as the Board of Health. You have the you have the ability to vote. This is where it's gotten it's gotten um, you know conflicted. Is that we 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 basically said the Board of Health will make the health based decision on whether or not the school should stay open or not. However, there's many other there's many other components. You know, not many other. Components. There's other components too. You know, it's not just health data reports of, of those kind of things. We also have you know other things that we we consider as part of that. So. The school committee can just as just as the Sunderland committee voted to close for two days, well, go remote two days prior to Thanksgiving. So, 
So you have that, you still have that, uh, you have that authority to do that. I think that it's, um, when you're talking about the meeting on the 29th, that perhaps we have to have a separate meeting and maybe we have a meeting on the 28th and we have a meeting of the joint meeting there to get everybody on the same page there before bringing the information to, I'm thinking out loud a little bit because yeah. I don't know what I'm bringing forward yet. I have a draft of it, but I bring forward yet. And I don't know how that's going to kind of pan out. So maybe we do, I'm thinking out loud and I have, a, you know, I have Conway after this, but the other, ch the other chairs, I'm just going to have to reach out to and see what, you know, what their thoughts are. Um, but maybe we have a meeting prior to the board of health to make sure the school committees are all on the same page before we hand it over to the board of health. Because I, I think we have heard from, um, at least from the frontier school committee about being careful about the board of health has a role in this, but the school committees also has a role in this as well. And that making sure that we're overlooking whatever we're creating for policy. I'm kind of almost talking myself into this idea that we should have a meeting probably on that Monday, um, a joint meeting, um, so forth. So anyway, that, that's oh, yeah. the idea. Does that make well, sense, Peter? The alternative would be to say, we should have a meeting a day or two later in case the Board of Health said, no, go ahead and reopen. And we were not sure we were comfortable with that. Correct. You could do that as well. Yeah, uh, just to echo exactly what uh, Darius said, definitely earlier in the year, uh, I was I was sort of grateful. Oh, the Board of Health is going to take over watching these metrics and they're the ones they're going to, you know, they do this all day and they're going to have the hand on the red button. Uh, and, and I still believe that they would tell us appropriately, you have to close if they saw the conditions that would tell them you have to close the schools. But what, what they can't tell us is, Oh, uh, the, the level of remote learning, uh, is, uh, it's not working for these students, so you should bring more in. Or, uh, well, uh, it's bad enough and the remote teaching is good enough that the incremental benefit to most students means that. So I'm sort of rewrapping uh, my head around the idea that school committee has a role. And yes, the, the Board of Health may step in and say, you have to walk away, but it's, it's on us to balance. And that's why I was also, uh, as people have said, very grateful to hear from the community uh, to try to understand what services can we keep open. You know, what, what are the the key priorities? Things like the internet cafe. You know, the, the things that we, we may want to close last, or how do we support our most vulnerable vulnerable students as well as possible, while at the same time uh, caring for the staff and making sure that uh, that we're addressing the health needs appropriately. Yes. So I guess in summary, I'll be reaching out about posting a meeting and such. Uh, Greg, I guess um, I guess for also feedback, uh, school committee members and member regarding planning a meeting, you can have plenty of emails back and forth about planning meetings. So you can give Greg any thoughts on that. Greg, I think probably I probably you know I, I need to set some direction. I'm going to set a meeting of the chairs. Um, just to get together to decide when you want to have a meeting um, or maybe we can do it by email, but just to, uh, to set up when it will be available and if everybody agrees with that process. Um, I think that, that that probably seems a prudent because people need to know going into this, you know, being these are the only two school committee meetings this week, people need to know what the process is going to be moving um, towards over the break. So, sound good? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's see, and certainly the uh, the item D, I know I'm skipping around a little bit on the agenda, the returning uh, remote model is is overcome by events, uh, but there was some content maybe planned to talk about uh, phase three and what that could look like. I don't know if we wanna go into that now at all. Then you wanna talk about phase three or you think it's a little premature right now given the other information that's going on right now? I kind of was setting, I'm giving you an out, but at the same time, you can talk about what your thoughts were there. No, I, I'm definitely comfortable talking about it now, and I'm going to present a tab here. Um, actually, Darius, I don't know if I have uh, permission to share my screen. Oh, now I can.
Okay, so uh, before I get started with a brief slide presentation, um, I do want to thank our families and the SES teaching staff. Uh, first, our families have done an incredible job supporting our school throughout this entire ordeal. Your patience, your flexibility, and understanding have been invaluable, and your continued support and partnership will continue to help us deliver strong remote and hybrid learning models moving forward. Additionally, the Sunderland staff has continued to impress. Any words that I can really share cannot capture how appreciative I am of their efforts. They have been going nonstop since our initial switch to remote learning last March, many putting countless hours over the summers preparing for the school year. The Sunderland staff have shown resilience, They've been problem solvers. They have approached this year with courage and confidence and maybe a few tears, but that's okay as it's a product of simply wanting to do the very best they can do for their students. The SES staff have been able to show their own personal unique gifts as, as educators again and again. A lot of great things and excellent instruction has happened all along. We're very proud of them. Um, so, uh, presentation for tonight's meeting. Let's see here. Uh, first, start off by looking at the numbers. We have eight or nine preschoolers currently in the hybrid model, and they are attending right now anywhere from one to four days a week. We have four remote learner preschoolers. In grades K through six, um, we have 92 hybrid learners which makes up 54% of our K through six student population. And we have 74 remote learners, 46%. As of right now, we have approximately 53 students who are coming to school four days a week in grades K through six. Then there are our cohort students, our two, two day cohort A students, 24. Our B students, 16, which totals 40 current 40 students currently in the two-day model. That's 40 out of 93. On cohort A days, which is Mondays and Thursdays, we have plus or minus, uh, give or take, 86 students in person. And on B days, Tuesdays and Fridays, we have around 78 students in person. Some of the staff discussions regarding phase three planning uh, looking at, we've talked about improvements of our current model. We've had discussions about increasing to three or four days of in-person learning for all hybrid learners. And we've talked about increasing in-person learning for some of our hybrid students. Some of the themes that have come up uh, in regards to improvements of our current model. Um, one thing that has occurred over and over again is finding appropriate workspaces outside of the classrooms. Sometimes our students uh, receive different services coming from other than those other than their main classroom teacher, whether it's a related service provider or a special education teacher. And we found it difficult for those services to be delivered in the cl classroom while other students are in there as well. Part of this is due to the need to not have adults go across multiple cohorts in classrooms. Uh, teacher prep time has come up as a reoccurring theme. One of the challenges with the in-person model is that usually when specials happen in the past, those are always out of the classroom. This year, for obvious reasons, uh, those specials are in the uh, taking place in the classroom with students in there and the teachers uh, you know, it's distracting to have adequate prep time. Uh, one of the themes that has also come up is indoor meals, whether it's snack or lunch, lunch time in the classrooms. And overall, we're looking at ways to increase student support. Some things we're looking to consider when there's going to be an increase of in-person learning, the health, safety, well-being of students and staff, the physical space in the building, planning time, logistics, such as scheduling, bathroom and lunch and transitions, and this challenge of still of teaching remote and hybrid students simultaneously still exists. So next steps, um, we're looking to continue to improve upon our current model. We're going to have building wide and grade level specific discussions. 
Some changes might include restructuring of classes to create in-person and remote classrooms, lunch outside of the classroom in the cafeteria, tweaking of schedules and re-examining usage of building space. I have a note there that depending on the number of hybrid and remote students at each grade level, changing classroom rosters around might not be possible. It really is different from one grade to the next, where some, some grade levels, it's an, it could be an easy switch, and others it probably um, would not work. And that's why the grade level specific discussions are happening. Next steps. Um, so I, I just had talked about looking to uh, continue to improve our current model and then also increasing in-person learning for some of our hybrid students. And I have some there bolded. Um, at the beginning of the year, we mentioned when we were talking initially about our internet cafe, we were talking about our students who really needed that in-person instruction and needed to be here four days to make progress and experience success. I emphasize that at the time, this couldn't be for all students, given the nature of where things are at. And unfortunately, I know this might be a disappointment, a disappointment to some families, but that's, um, that's still where we're at at this time. We're going to be having grade level specific discussions, uh, looking specifically at students who might be struggling academic, academically and or socially. And if we are going to continue to increase, um, excuse me, if we are going to look to increase some of our students, our two day a week students right now, we're looking to have that transition happen towards the, the end of January with no set date right now at this time. With that being said, you know, if, if families um, are experiencing um, difficulties at home with the social emotional well being of their student, they need to please reach out to our teaching team. You know, we, we're ready and able to help at any point. Um, so I, I really want to emphasize and, and drive that point home that families do need to be in communication with us if anything is coming up. Um, and we'll be doing the same um, in reverse. Uh, additional points that I wanted to uh, provide to the committee is that our current model is going well. You know, is it perfect in all areas? Absolutely not. But our teachers are working so hard day in and day out to deliver high quality in-person and remote instruction. This whole thing, this whole crisis, there's a continuum of comfort level. And that's with students, that's with parents, and that's with our teaching staff. So as, as, a, as a school community, I'm encouraging everyone to come together and recognize that. And that one person's own life experiences differs vastly from the person next door. And we should be respecting that. And knowing that we're each coming at this from a different place. Uh, teacher planning time. Uh, our teachers right now are planning for remote instruction. They're planning for in-person instruction for two day a week students and in-person instruction for four day a week students. So that's, a, that's very significant. Um, I've heard time and time again that our teachers are working harder than they ever have before. I spoke earlier about our grade level numbers and dynamics and how easy switches at, at one grade level with an increase of in-person learners may not be possible at another grade level just because due to numbers. And then I mentioned it before, the health and well-being of or wellness of both students and staff should remain our, our number one priority. And that's that's what I have for the presentation. So um, obviously it's nothing solidly concrete with specific dates, but just something for everyone to consider. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Outstanding, thank you, Ben. Any questions? All right. Um, in that case, let's see. How about the uh, FY22 budget discussion? Are we? I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so we are in the early stages of planning for next school year. Uh, started to take a look at the numbers. We're a little bit behind. Normally you would probably be getting the first draft of the budget with this meeting, but um, we knew we've been delayed given the circumstances. 
Um, <clears throat> the town has requested we be present at the late February meeting for the budget presentation to the select board. Mm -hmm. um, and our goal will be to get the first draft to you all at the January meeting with a second draft. I believe we meet February 2nd. Um, and that'll give a couple of weeks in between to make any additional updates that we need to before we present to the select board. Um, but we are looking at a level serviced approach for the budget, meaning our starting point will be not to make any reductions or changes to existing staffing or programming. So we will start by looking at basically what the adjustments are for contract uh, cost of living and step increases, and then anyone who's not on a union contract, the traditional wage that we usually give for an increase there, we'll, we'll plug those numbers in. Um, and then Ben and I are also in discussion with Darius about some of the needs that we may have asked for last year that we ended up putting off that might need to come back to the table for further discussion. Um, and then really just looking closely at the numbers for this year to see where we've had some savings and is this a multiple year saving and seeing if we can you know try to make some reductions in other lines that mm -hmm. will hopefully help offset some of the increases um <clears throat> i just want to remind everyone that this we knew was going to be a harder budget year for 22 than 21 um, because with the level funding in 21 we really didn't make any major cuts um, we did eliminate one new position that we were supposed to add but we really just kind of reallocated things to school choice based on savings we had from the budget freeze last year. So going into 22 is where we start to see some potential problems because those expenses that are now on other funding sources, um, they're not gonna be able to get moved back to local budget. Again, issues that we knew were gonna come up, we'll do what we can to you know, stick within the same parameters. Um, and look at revolving funds where we can, you know, special education, school lunch, and then um, early childhood. Those are all areas that, you know, have been challenging this year for us to continue to navigate. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't see that getting much better. Um, but without state numbers also, it'll be a little bit hard for the towns and for us to fully move forward. So I'm not sure if, you know, our timeline will continue to get extended, but we'll at least have some draft numbers to discuss next month and then again in early February. Outstanding, thank you, Shelley. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, and the need for that uh, that new position hasn't probably gone away either. Um, any other comments, questions? Um, are we still expecting two new kindergarten classes next year? While we're only graduating one sixth grade, do we, are we expecting to need to add a, a classroom next year? It's probably for Ben. Too early to tell. We really don't know the numbers at this point. Anyone else? Actually, to follow up, Ben, when will we know those numbers? We send out the registration forms in beginning of January. And part of that process is our early childhood director reaching out to local preschools and seeing how many students are actually on the on the radar. So hopefully by the end of January, early February, but it's a uh, fluid process. But obviously it changes the discussion for the budget. For sure. I, think a, I think it's a good question, Jessica, because we don't know how human behavior is gonna be and if people are gonna enroll early before schools have reached going back, you know, hopefully we're gonna be back to normal. I mean. That's kind of the game plan. We'll be back to normal next year. You know, are they going to be buying into a normal this far away from, you know, without even the vaccinations having gone out? So it'll be, it's a good, it's a, I guess it's a good thing. Not a good thing to worry about. So it's a good point. Yeah, and so Sunderland is notorious for, for late ads and people popping up, uh, you know, grad students or whatever. In that case, uh, if we're all set uh, onto capital, the capital budget. Sure. So um, I shared with you all the uh, the capital plan, um, and we looked at it briefly. I believe last meeting, if I remember correctly. Um, and so we decided we were going to vote this this week um, on what do we want to move forward. 
I did have a conversation with um, the uh, town administrator um, and kind of give him a general overview. Uh, we will be competing with other town needs this year. I think we are every year, but there's other some safety cons needs that they're they're also um, putting forward. So I said that we would put together our list and we'll sub submit it by order of our priority, um, and then let the town take a review of it. At that point, I'm sure they're still working on what their numbers are for available funds and as they collect all the uh, wants and needs from the different departments. So um, do we need to review them again or do people want to go through them again? I, I, we kind of talked about them last time and I can um, I can kind of do a quick run through if you want to do that. Um, Mr. Chair, what would you like to do? Uh, say, um, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable. Let's, let's list them so we got, we got people listening. We'll do a, a quick list through and then uh, We'll take a motion to, to vote and vote it out. Yeah, what I can do is I'll quickly share my screen and put it on the screen. It'll probably be the easiest way for us to think about it. So here it comes. So what you're seeing here for those of you on the screen, the top part in gray, obviously it says complete. Those are the um, things that we've completed in the past few couple of years. Um, in progress are the ones that moved forward last year, the FY21, you can see over here um, there that we are in progress with the band repairs and the flooring um, um, in the library office and guidance. And so basically looking at, you know, we basically have five, five things that we, we you know, considered category one. Um, basically, you're, we're grouping these two together, so you're really looking at four. Um, so, but in our order of priority, I guess probably should be pushing this one up one. But, you know, I think we want to continue the phase two of the rim band project where we're replacing the rim band around the school at 90, about just under $10,000 per year. And we kind of, we've already built that over five years to break up that cost. So I think the idea is that, you know, if you start skipping a year, that's gonna, I think that becomes a problem. So I think it needs to be up there. And then the other number one priority is the, the steamer kettle boiler in the um, lunchroom has already been welded to get us through this school year. We've kind of gotten lucky that we haven't, um, haven't do as much lunch service as using it as much, getting through it, but we do need to replace that um, as it is one of the major um, devices used to, to offer, to serve lunch. Um, and then I guess the next two are probably tied, Ben, and you can jump in at any point, tied for number three and four being the, you know, we have some rotten gable vents in, um, um, at the top uh, where the trim is and it's, it's starting to fail. Um, and that's around a $10,000 price just under there. And then the last one, which is kind of the most complicated and we talked about before, complicated in the sense of just, you don't just look at it and understand it needs to be repaired, but um, the underground um, oil tank um, needs to have a better access, spill protection, um, a remote gauge in order to, you know, to make sure that um, we can see when we're running low so we don't run out. Uh, right now we do it with the dipstick and that environmentally is not the proper way to be doing that anymore. There's new regulations and such. And we also do not have a protection um, if there was ever a spill upon delivery. And I think Ben kind of talked about that in detail last time. So I gave a quick overview on that. So, um, so the, yeah, those are the four slash, I mean, in the two of these we have to put together, um, the 17 and the, and the, and the 3,500, because 3,500 falls below what is a capital expense, but it's really too much for us to absorb within our um, yearly budget. And if you're gonna fix one part of the oil tank, you might as well get the remote gauge working as part of that. So um, we probably, honestly, we probably could just add it on here and just round that number up to, you know, 21, uh, 21,000. So um, yeah, there you go. Outstanding. Um, Peter did talk about us at the last meeting. It's still in my notes to do it. Peter is talking about, we really need to organize a long-term capital because we're not going to be able to chip away at this at, in a fast enough fashion. Um, we, I, well, at least that was the general discussion. Um, I really think that conversation is going to have to be with the town. And so when, um, and it's going to, it's on my to-do list. It's just not happening yet. It may not happen this next month or two either based on all our other needs. Uh, Darius, I, I actually was at the Selectman meeting, Select Board meeting last night and raised that subject. And there was, uh, you know, nodding heads that indicated, yeah, we got to be able to do something like, a, you know, a more, a more uh, comprehensive capital plan. Um, and, and uh, you know, addressing it particularly to Scott Bergeron, who was involved with the Frontier Plan. 
And I think, and he's also the head of the capital planning committee in town. And so when, when that committee starts meeting and I'm on that committee, we'll not only bring up this list of stuff for FY22, but also the idea of a you know, more comprehensive capital plan and see if we can make some progress on that over this winter. Um, and there'll be certainly one and maybe a couple of times that I'll be you know, hoping that, that Bill can be at these meetings and obviously coming remotely makes it actually easier to get to. Um, and you, know, you or Ben as needed. Um, but I'll keep you posted. I don't know when that's going to be. I'll keep you posted. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I absolutely like to. I, I, I like attending the stuff. This is concrete stuff that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think enjoy, you can I actually enjoy doing. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the, I don't know exactly how we're gonna, you know, how we're gonna play this, but we got to get it started. We got to get the discussion started first, and uh, it sure helps that that the what you've done at Frontier has been uh regularly applauded by scott is you know a good thing to do so um i, I think we got an opportunity here to to get something done but mostly will take place not at school committee meetings but at um the capital planning committee stuff all right so do i do i have a motion to uh approve the uh the capital projects as presented so moved all right I'll second if no one else. Oh, Jessica, second. Life's good. Second, sure. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, all in favor, let's see. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Uh, Peter? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Unanimous. And as has already been uh, pointed out, it, it's absolutely amazing that while all this is going on, the school has been doing a school improvement plan, uh, including multiple. Uh, you know, we have we have to vote it tonight, but uh, Ben, I think it's your show to to review what it is, so we can vote so, that. Oh, go ahead. I just I have to jump off because I got to start the Conway meeting and broadcast that to YouTube and stuff. So I got a couple of other computers set up in my office to go do that. Um, so I'll be back, but I'm just gonna step away. So it's Ben's show here for now. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm going to pop over to um, Conway as well. So I'll see you all next time. Thank you, Shelly. So the uh, Sunderland Elementary School School Improvement Plan, uh, goal number one, remote learning access and technology. Implement highly effective teaching practices and strategies, which can be delivered both synchronously and asynchronously to ensure students access and engagement across all grade levels and student profiles. We have another goal on academic delivery and due to the disruptions in education because of COVID-19, teachers will identify learning gaps in tiered instructional methodologies and tools to ensure students access to grade level content identifying learning gaps and student-centered supports in the areas of math and ELA are top academic priorities. Social emotional learning and health, prioritize social emotional learning, wellness and health across all grade levels for both students and staff. Anti-racism and equity, prioritize initiatives and practices that continuously identify, describe and dismantle systemic racism and oppression embedded within our schools and communities. And then as always, we have our wonderful early childhood playground project where we're partnering with local businesses, community members, and town committees to renovate the early childhood playground. And under each of these goals, there are um, different action steps and um, tasks for completion. I just wanted to present something that was a little bit more user-friendly. Any questions? Peter? Uh, ben, I got a question about the last item, the, yeah. the, the playground. And, and that is that I know you got a little bit of money from them, from uh, the CPA funds early on, and then were sort of like reluctant to go back for more. Um, I did notice, I think it was Conway that just got a chunk of money you know, committed from their CPA funds for their regular playground. Um, 
and I think I saw on the plan here that, you know, a plan to go back to the committee and, um, yeah, I think that's definitely what you ought to be doing. And cause you know, they were, they were looking around how to spend all this money that they got. Yeah. So I met with the uh, capital planning commission last spring and I gave them an update on our fundraising, um, progress and different steps we had taken to apply for other various grants, um, that, you know, in the end did not pan out. Um, they want us to proceed this year and apply for CPA funds for, for the uh, early childhood playground. If you recall last summer, um, we had also talked about applying for uh, municipality ADA grant funds. However, to get a stronger application, the, they, the state wants to see something being matched from the town. So unfortunately that ADA grant, um, the due date was early, uh, early October, early to mid October. And we haven't lined up any CPA funds yet because those are approved through, through town meeting. So the plan will be to meet with the CPC officials or, or board members this January, put together a proposal, um, see where that comes out, see if it's voted on. And if it is approved, um, whatever that balance is, then go back to the other grant next fall and, and move forward from there. Okay. If you want someone to, you know, ride shotgun for you with that CPC money, CPC meeting, I'd be glad to, you know, go along too. Peter, take it away. You can. No, I don't want to. Slide. Only secondhand, you know, you're, you're the boss. Yes, I, I would love support. Okay. Always. I, I think that's something that that the town ought to be, you know, putting money behind. Yep. And they're and they were like I said, they had something like, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars of uncommitted money right now in their uh you know, in the bank. And 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 that has yeah, that amount has built up over the last couple of years. And so when we initially um applied for the seed funding just to get the um, site analysis and the the conceptual drawings done. There wasn't the balance that there was that there is now. Good. Outstanding. Any other questions? Motion. Uh, uh, motion to approve the school improvement plan. Move we approve the school improvement plan as presented. Outstanding. Second, I'll second. Excellent. All right, Keith. Yes. Maisie. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Peter. Yes. Greg. Yes. All right. Unanimous again. That brings us to uh, any reports. Uh, we, we've lost the superintendent. Uh, ben, do you have a, uh, or, oh, oh, he's back. I don't have a report though. Okay, understood. Is that is that me? Yes. So um, I have a slightly different principal's report and then in, uh, reports passed. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to recognize one of our great educators at Sunderland Elementary School, who is retiring at the end of this month. Ellen Von Flatern started off working in the kids club, then she transitioned to six, uh, second grade, third grade, and fifth grade before finally settling into her current role as a sixth grade teacher. Mrs. V has served on the SES School Council, has been a grade level leader in our district, and was the recipient of the Grinspoon Excellence in Teaching Award. She has many incredible attributes that have allowed her to experience success. Her friendly, outgoing personality has helped to create a strong sense of community amongst her teaching colleagues and her students. She has a great sense of humor. She's very smart and organized, and she has superb classroom management skills. Her firm and serious but friendly demeanor has helped to create a comfortable learning environment for her students. It has been an absolute pleasure working alongside Ellen, and I can easily say that every student and every staff member whose path 
have crossed with her during their her educational career are better because of her. We are going to miss her very much and hope that her retirement brings a lot of relaxation, cuddle time with her grandkids, and whatever else will make her the most happy. So thank you, Ellen. You are cherished by, cherished by all of your colleagues and you will truly be missed. Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you, and thank you, Ellen. All right. Um, I don't see any need to do the executive session. So unless anyone has anything else, I'll uh, we'll take a motion to uh, adjourn. What heck, I'll move it. Can we have a second? Second. Second, just get seconds. All right. So let's see. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Jessica? Yes. All right. And me, yes. So again, unanimous. Thank you, everyone.